for many are called, but few are chosen. My dearly beloved in Christ, all people are destined to salvation and receive sufficient grace to attain it. In the first chapter of St. John's Gospel, he says, he enlightens every man who comes into the world. If people fail in the terms of the scriptural verse, for many are called, but few are chosen, indicate that many do, it's due to an abuse of free will and because of their own perversity. Were it not for the culpable neglect and deadly indifference with which people are accustomed to treat the things of God and the concerns of their mortal soul, the number of those chosen would be immeasurably greater. My dear and beloved in Christ, numerous verses of Scripture confirm the truth that the number of the saved, although great, is small in comparison with the lost. Jesus Christ was asked, Lord, are only a few to be saved? He replied, strive to enter by the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. The following verses from Christ's Sermon on the Mount deserve serious attention. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there are who enter that way. How narrow the gate. And close the way that leads to life. And few there are who find it. While illustrating the difficulty of the Catholic way of life, our Lord laments the fewness of those who in fact follow it. The gate through which we enter upon the way of salvation, the path to which it leads, is narrow. It's a fact of experience that there are only relatively few who walk along the path to eternal life. Many types or figures in the Old Testament indicate that the majority are not saved. When Almighty God punished the world for its sins by the flood, only Noah and his family, eight persons, were saved in the ark. The majority were lost. A mere handful were saved. In chapter 19 in the book of Genesis, we read that Lot besought God to spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of ten just men. However, the cities were so perverse, he could not find even ten just men. Angels led Lot, his wife, and two daughters out of the wicked cities before God destroyed them with hellfire and brimstone. The spiritual writers tell us that the world is like Sodom. Most lost souls are damned through the sins of lust. Our Lady of Fatima lamented, more souls go to hell for sins of the flesh than for any other reason. Moses led the chosen people from Egypt, yet with most of them, St. Paul wrote, God was not well pleased. God punished the chosen people for their murmuring and incredulity, by allowing them to wander through the desert for 40 years. God said, In the wilderness shall your carcasses lie, all you that were numbered from 20 years old and upward and have murmured against me shall not enter the land over which I have lifted up my hand to make you dwell therein, except Caleb and Joshua. Of the original 600,000 who departed from Egypt only, to reach the promised land. Isaiah the prophet likens the number of those who are saved to the gleanings in the harvest field and the few grapes left after the vintage. The fruit thereof that shall be left upon them shall be like one cluster of grapes and as the shaking of the olive tree, two or three berries in the top of a branch and four or five upon the top of the tree, saith the Lord, the God of Israel." Our Lord told his disciples, Do not be afraid, little flock, for it has pleased your Father to give you the kingdom. Christ describes the elect in this place as his little flock, writes Venerable Bede, an account of the greater number of the reprobate, or rather through his love of humility, because though the church be most numerous, yet he wishes it to continue in humility to the end of the world, and by humility to arrive at the reward which he has promised to the humble. Many hold that the number of the lost to exceed that of the saved based on human reason, experience, and numerous examples from Scripture. St. John Chrysostom asked, How many, think you, will be saved of this city of Antioch? It's an unpleasant thing, but I say it, it, but say it I must. 
Of the 100,000 or more inhabitants of Antioch, scarcely a 100 will be saved. And even of these, I have my doubt. The uncertainty of our salvation is expressed throughout the New Testament in the gospel parable of today. The guest found without a wedding garment represents all sinners in the state of mortal sin and void of the grace of God. Our Lord teaches us that if we wish to participate in the joys of heaven, we must fulfill two requirements. First, we must be baptized and possess a true faith, which is symbolized by the invitation of the wedding feast. Secondly, we must have a wedding garment. That is to say, be in the state of grace. We're not simply saved by accepting Jesus as our personal Savior. Although not the only view taken on the subject, some spiritual writers believe that the majority of Catholics are not saved. Many of the fathers of the church, including St. John Chrysostom, St. Augustine, and St. Gregory, hold the same. Unfortunately, Numerous Catholics live in the state of mortal sin and refuse to overcome their sinful habits. Some Catholics live in injustice and fail to make restitution for their dishonesty and theft. As they live, so generally do they die. My dearly beloved in Christ, the salvation of the soul requires personal cooperation with the grace of God. Some non-practicing Catholics die suddenly in accidents with no time to prepare their souls for death without the grace of the sacraments. In some deathbed confessions, the soul has difficulty evoking true sorrow for sin because it's been hardened by repeated rejections of God's grace and a whole life of sin. We must continually strive to grow in grace and avoid sin since our salvation is not secured until death. We must be aware of the dangers of both complacency and presumption. St. Paul assures us that God wishes all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He's ready to give to all the help necessary for salvation, but he grants it, says St. Augustine, only to those who ask him. Our Lord said, ask and it shall be given to you. Although this promise is conditional with reference to temporal goods, Christ has promised absolutely to give spiritual graces to anyone who asks him. It's a common opinion of theologians that those who have each reached the age of reason, prayer is absolutely necessary for salvation. St. Alphonsus said, he who prays will certainly save his soul. He who does not pray will certainly lose his soul. Without prayer, it's impossible to resist temptations and keep the commandments. St. Thomas Aquinas taught after baptism, continual prayer is necessary to man in order that he may enter heaven. For though by baptism our sins are remitted, there still remains this strong inclination to sin, to assail us from within, and the world and the devil to assail us from without. Prayer vivifies the soul as the soul gives life to the body. As a body... Without the soul cannot live, so the soul without prayer is dead, says St. John Chrysostom. Especially when a person is in danger of death, he must pray for perseverance in the state of grace and eternal salvation. A person who has not a special devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary will find it very hard to persevere. For St. Bernard says, all divine graces, and especially this one of perseverance, which are the greatest of all, come to us by the means of Mary. In today's gospel, the man expelled from the wedding feast represents all the various types of unrepentant sinners. A general warning to all is given by our Lord's words. Many are called, but few are chosen. St. Gregory the Great said, Consider that all of us have been called by faith to the marriage of the heavenly king. We all believe and confess the mystery of his incarnation, sharing in the banquet of the divine word. But at a future date, the king of judgment is to come. We know that we have been called. We do not know whether we have been chosen. It's all the more necessary, therefore, that we abase ourselves with humility, since we do not have this certainty. There are some who never try to do good. There are others who, although they began once, fail to persevere. 
We see one man pass nearly all his life in wickedness, but as he nears his end, he returns to God by repentance and true penance. Another may seem to live the life of a saint, but in end his days by falling into error and malice. One begins well and ends better. Another plunges into evil from an early age and goes from bad to worse through his days. Each man then must live in fear, for he does not know what is to come, since we must never forget, but rather often repeat and meditate on the words, many are called, but few are chosen. I'd just like to close with a story. An old woman had been a long time away from the sacraments, and always to come next Christmas or next Easter, but never came. At last she was too infirm to come, but refused to make her confession at home, saying she would come when she was able. A mission was held in the parish, and the missioners, after several visits, got her to promise to make her confession. Not today, though. Tomorrow, she said, and no persuasions could change her. Next morning, when the priest came about midday, he noticed that uh, there were things outside her door and there was no answer to the knocking. One of the neighbors got in round the back and the old woman was found dead in bed. On the chair at her bedside lay a little diary which she had kept open at its last entry. I'm going to confession tomorrow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.